O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell all his wonderful works. It's my pleasure to greet all of you this morning and to extend a special greeting to those of you who are visiting. We're happy you're here, certainly hope you enjoyed the service. We'll come and worship with us again and that the entire event will be meaningful to you. I also invite you to participate in any of the programs that the chapel sponsors. This is the first Sunday of our new church year and uh, there are lots of things happening. Let me uh, share with you some of the announcements that are in the bulletin and some that aren't. First of all, we've got a little bit of a, a, little bit of a snafu on the opening page with who's doing what. Uh, the spacing is a little bit weird there. So uh, Flo Bickle is the organist, uh, Sally Ploger is the soloist, Kelly Miller's playing the chimes. Uh, then we've got the Divisors as the uh, greeters and the Orange Juice Fellowship. And uh, Jan Burke is our liturgist, so aside from that, uh, everything's right, which makes about, <laughs> makes about two things being right. <laughs> but, but anyhow, if that's the worst that happens, we're in really good shape. In terms of our announcements, uh, there is one there about the Haven of RCS Faces of Domestic Violence. Uh, that luncheon is on October 27th, and uh, a number of uh, people from the church often go. If you are going, the instructions are to call Nina at... Uh, uh, at RCS to make your reservation, but indicate whether or not you want to sit at the table with other people from the chapel by the sea. And that will be taken care of then through, um, through RCS. Uh, this is the, we've got an envelope in your bulletin. Uh, this is the last Sunday we're going to be collecting for those who wish to contribute to aid to Louisiana and Italy, where they've had all those uh, tragic uh, natural disasters. Uh, so if, if you're going to use that envelope, it would be for that purpose, and there are baskets in the Friendship Foyer and in the narthex to receive your offerings. Next week, we're going to start collecting for our Stop Hunger Now program. That's going to be on October 15th. Uh, that's where we put together 15,000 uh, meals for people in undeveloped countries. We need money to pay for buying the materials and for shipping them. We need in the neighborhood of $4,000, a little over $4,000. So I'm, I'm warning you ahead of time, if you wish to contribute to that, and you've always been very generous with that, it's a wonderful program. We will start collecting for that next week. And Rick Owen is in the Friendship Foyer. If you already know that you want to contribute something and or you want to volunteer to help put together the meals. So he does have sign-up sheets that can be taken care of this morning. I'll let you read the little announcement from Linda Walter about having a, uh, a, sleep, uh, a sleep number bed. Uh, she's not going to bring it here. You can't use it during the sermon time. So, uh, but, it, but that is available and the information is there. The luncheon today, uh, this is for, um, this is for the, uh, the Sunday school. They're, they're having their kickoff luncheon today, their kickoff program. Uh, Joe Cregan, our education director, has put together a wonderful uh, lunch program. There are going to be pizza, blizzards from uh, Dairy Queen, and uh, prizes. So what, uh, the kids who are here, I'm sure that they're all going to look forward to that. I also want to make mention of the fact the new screen came in. The rest of you are going to get to see it next week when we have our, uh, our, our theater open house, so to speak, after the worship service instead of just the uh, more limited Orange Juice Fellowship. We'll be having some, some hors d'oeuvres and orange juice in Chapel Hall so you can see the new setup. But yesterday, Joe Cregan and uh, Rick Fry were working on that thing from the morning until after 11 o'clock at night, putting it up, putting it up. It's an enormous screen. It covers practically the entire stage. So next week you're going to get to see that. So uh, Rick and uh, Joe were here all day yesterday, and Steve Spencer and uh, Rick Menke were here most of the day helping with that. And uh, uh, I popped in and out to encourage them, and they, <laughs> they really worked hard. So we thank them for all their efforts, and you're going to see the results of that next week. I think that pretty well covers... Oh. No, that's it. I covered, covered all my announcements. So uh, I, I trust that you will read the rest of them. Let's now begin our service of worship.
Our invitation to celebration we will do responsively as our call to worship. On this day, we look to the past. And we remember what happened 15 years ago on 9-11. On this day, we look to the present. And strive to see what lessons we have learned as we face tomorrow. Today, we look to the future. And commit ourselves in our worship to be more loving invocation we will do in unison as we call upon God, God of the past and the future. It is the present that we learn from the past as we prepare for the future. Grant us greater strength and courage as we face whatever tomorrow might bring. Show us where and when we have been less loving and caring than you want us to be. Enable us to change from what we are into what we can become. Open our hearts and our minds to the needs and concerns of our fellow creatures so that a too often violent and hating world might be made different. Lift us even now as we pray in Jesus' words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet In gratitude for the many gifts that we have received and in commitment to the work of this church, let us be generous in our morning offering.
God of the past and the present and the future, God of love and laughter and life, God the creator and the protector and the sustainer, hear our prayer as we contemplate our world, what it is and what it can and should be. On this 9-11, we remember what happened 15 years ago and realize that the impact of that event has changed our world. We are no longer as accepting of differences or as trusting of others. We no longer feel as secure as we once did. We no longer work as hard at loving our neighbors, especially those neighbors who are not like us. And yet we still come to you who tell us what we must do if we are to be true to what we claim to believe. Make our faith stronger and our trust greater. Enable us to overcome our fears and live life to the fullest in hope and joy. Grant us the grace to work toward becoming all you want us to be. We look around and see that most of the people of our world are good and caring. Help us remember that when we contemplate and encounter those who aren't. Make us more civil and compassionate, less intolerant and angry, more kind and uplifting, less discouraging and denigrating. Show us that we are indeed part of your universal family and that our kin are all the people of the world. So we pray coming to you now with great humility as we seek to articulate our own private and personal concerns. Amen.
this morning some fairly familiar passages, one from the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, one from the Christian Scriptures. I'm reading first from Joshua 6, verses 15 through 21. And uh, this occurred as the, uh, the Hebrews, after their escape from Egypt, were moving into uh, what they called the Promised Land. Again, Joshua 6, verses 15 through 21. On the seventh day they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was not only that day that they marched around the city seven times, and at the seventh day time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers we sent. As for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction, so as not to covet and take away any of the devoted things, and make the camp of Israel an object for destruction, bringing trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. Then they devoted the destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. Let me read to you now from Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he is a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May these words acquire greater meaning for us as we continue together in our worship this morning.
almost hate to get up after that. Man. <laughs> I was sitting in my office on that Tuesday morning. I'm not sure what I was doing, but whatever it was, I was interrupted by a phone call from Herb Early, one of our sextons, telling me to turn on the small television set that we had here at the time. The screen came on and revealed an image which might have been a scene from a science fiction movie. There were two skyscrapers next to each other and one of them was on fire about three quarters of the way up. As I tried to hear what the newscaster was reporting and thinking that there must have been some kind of terrible accident, another plane flew into the other building. Now it was obvious that what was happening was not accidental. I did not need the reporter to tell me that these were the Twin Towers in Lower Manhattan, and there was not a whole lot more information he could share because details at this point were sketchy at best. The chapel staff remained glued to the tube as images emerged of smoke and debris raining down on the streets of New York City, of people, some of them covered with dirt and blood, running away from the destruction, of police officers and firefighters rushing toward what was turning more and more into a nightmare of flames and rubble, of sirens blaring and people screaming and smoke billowing and newscasters trying desperately to find out what was going on, of first responders attempting to put out blazes while others organizing made plans to search for survivors and rescued all who could be rescued. After all this time, I don't remember the chronology of the reporting. I don't remember when we were told of the plane which had struck the Pentagon and about how many lives had been lost and how much damage had been done. I don't remember when we learned that still another plane had come down in a field in Pennsylvania or that this happened because the passengers hearing of the Twin Towers assaults took matters into their own hands and attacked their attackers, forcing the plane to crash rather than destroy more lives at another target. I don't remember how and when information emerged regarding all those who all those assassins were or the extent of the devastation in terms of lives and property lost. I do remember that, needless to say, we did not get a whole lot of work done that day. Today, today is the 15th anniversary of 9-11, and we are still living with the aftermath of that tragic and incomprehensible event. Almost 3,000 people were killed in the attacks on the Twin Towers. Hundreds more died as a result of the attack at the Pentagon and the crashed plane in Pennsylvania. And tens and tens of thousands have lost their lives and their homes, most of them in the Middle East, but also in America and Europe, because of retaliation back and forth subsequent to that horrendous day. Suspicion for the attacks quickly fell on Al-Qaeda. The United States responded by launching its war on terror as it invaded Afghanistan to depose the Taliban, which had harbored Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda's leader, initially denied involvement in 9-11, but in 2004 claimed responsibility, citing United States support of Israel, the presence of American troops in Saudi Arabia, and sanctions against Iraq as motives. It took almost 10 years for bin Laden to be brought to justice, and the repercussions of what happened 15 years ago are still felt all over the world as terrorism has grown in impact and increased in violence. Additionally, there is no end in sight, political and military promises notwithstanding. It is interesting to note as we look back over the span of 15 years and concentrate on the 9-11 event itself, that in many ways it demonstrated the worst in people and the best in people. Now we can see where 9-11 demonstrated the worst in people as we look at the hijackers themselves and the organizations and the movement which they represented. Those who have subsequently become terrorists undoubtedly have some legitimate concerns regarding what they oppose, but their cruelty, their viciousness, their inhumanity, their indiscriminate killing of anyone and everyone who gets in their way is totally inexcusable and incomprehensible. They have lost their humanity. And we can see where 9-11 demonstrated the best in people as we look at all those professionals and volunteers who rushed to the rescue, knowing the risk but without regard for their own safety and well-being. Did you know that 343 firefighters and 72 police officers lost their lives? And dozens of ordinary citizens were injured or killed as they too attempted 
to help others reach safety. None of this has changed with the passage of time. Terrorists are still wreaking havoc by perpetrating indiscriminate death and destruction, as we can see by events in such places as Somalia and Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and France and Belgium and Orlando and San Bernardino. But people of goodwill, again professional and volunteer, do all they can to help their fellow human beings while making their own well-being in the process at risk. As we can see by events in such places as Somalia and Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and Libya and France and Belgium and Orlando and San Bernardino. And I would suggest that ultimately the good outweighs the bad in terms of numbers and impact. Many stories considered by some to be miracles came out of the 9-11 event. One person traveling from his summer home experienced car trouble which lasted through the morning of 9-11 and then corrected itself. Another decided to get a cup of coffee and left the 80th floor in one of the buildings just before the attack. The irony being that she had not had a cup of coffee for over a decade and doesn't know why she suddenly craved one now. Still another vomited on his suit and thus missed his carpool, requiring him to take the train to work and arrive at his office just after the first plane attacked. I have a niece who had an appointment near the Twin Towers and because she wasn't feeling all that well that morning, arrived there later than intended. There should have been 5,000 more people in the Pentagon on that morning, but because of renovation work, it was nearly empty. Miracle or luck? This kind of reminds me of those tragic incidences when people survive disasters which claim the lives of others. They attribute their good fortune to the intervention of God. I understand their gratitude, but I wonder then about those who died and apparently were not also under God's protective care. And of course, some would wonder why if God loves us, he did not prevent 9-11 and events like it from happening in the first place. The claim of terrorists is that they are doing what they are doing in the name of religion. I would suggest that, that, is really, that it is really more about power than it is about faith. For the most part, you see, terrorists don't have power. They are by and large the ignorant, the weak, the dispossessed, those who cannot see their way to a better future and have lost hope in the present. I'm talking now about the followers, not necessarily the leaders. The leaders being the ones who are in charge, who send their underlings out to kill and die, who make the threats and articulate the demands, who go on camera to show how tough they are. And they claim to do it all in the name of their God. But do they? I read two rather startling passages from the Bible this morning one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. This is partly an answer to those who argue that Islam itself is violent and murderous in contrast to Judaism and Christianity. In Joshua we see that after having reached the borders of the promised land, Canaan, spies were sent out to determine how the Israelites could conquer what they felt that God had bequeathed to them. Perhaps you remember that the spies went to the prostitute Rahab, who hid them and who, as a result, they promised would be spared when the Hebrews attacked the city. The city was totally encircled and subsequently conquered. And at the command of God, so the Hebrews believed and claimed, every living thing in Jericho was killed. Men, women, children, oxen, sheep, donkeys. Only Rahab, her family, and all the gold and silver, the bronze and iron, were spared this valuable stuff going into God's treasury. And then later they did the same thing when they conquered the city of Ai. Why? What had the leaders and the citizens of Jericho and Ai done to deserve such punishment? They refused to roll over and play dead. They refused to give up their homes because the Israelites said that this land, land which had belonged to Jericho and Ai for centuries, had been given to them by their God. With the God you believe in, act in such a way Yet there it is in the Bible. Let's turn to Revelation. This book is purported to articulate a vision of John of Patmos, a vision regarding the end of the world and the coming of the kingdom. Without going into extensive detail, let me share that it talks about how the good will triumph over the wicked as the entire world is embroiled in bloodshed and destruction. 
And the scene about which I read to you has Jesus Christ, his eyes flashing flames, coming on a white horse as a great war leader, garbed in blood-drenched robes and with a sword extending from his mouth with which he will strike down the nations. Then we are told he will rule with a rod of iron, thus demonstrate the fu- demonstrating the fury and the wrath of God. This is Jesus, the Prince of Peace we're talking about here. This is Jesus, the one the pro- Gospels tell us wanted everyone to love everyone and even forgive one's enemies. This is the Jesus who preached about overcoming evil with good. Would the God you believe in act in such a way? Yet there it is in the Bible. I am not an apologist for the Koran, nor am I defending it in any way. I am not suggesting that the actions of Islamist terrorists can in any way be excused. I am not suggesting that there are not in the Koran passages that support and encourage violence. I am merely pointing out that there are also such passages in both the Old and the New Testaments, which do exactly the same thing. And that if one were to concentrate only on such passages and act on them, As if they were the will of God, what some fanatic Muslims do in the name of Allah could be done by fanatic Jews in the name of Yahweh and fanatic Christians in the name of Jehovah. As an aside, consider carefully the words we sang in our middle hymn, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It was used during the Civil War to encourage tens of thousands of Northern Americans to kill tens of thousands of Southern Americans. Hopefully today we sing it because we like the tune and we know the tune. The song has historical value and we sing it with patriotic fervor rather than with religious fervor. At the heart of all three religions is the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Such words are found in the Koran. Such words are found in the Old Testament. Such words are found in the New Testament. Are there other contradictory words also found in these three holy books? To be sure. Which is why Muslims and Jews and Christians have to decide which words better describe their perception of God and what God wills from his people in terms of their thoughts, their attitudes, their actions. On this 15th anniversary of 9-11, let's remember that horrific event with grief and with anger. But let's put the blame where it belongs, squarely on the heads of those viciously vengeful nuts and hate-filled thugs who were responsible for what happened and tried to justify their actions by claiming that they did it in the name of God. But let's also remember those who died on 9-11 as victims or as rescuers, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, and representatives of numerous religions and cultures with admiration for their bravery and sorrow for their loss. Tragedy can bring out the best or the worst in people. 9-11 did both, but more of the good than of the bad. And I think God wants us to stick with that golden rule no matter what.
as we leave here, may it be with the realization of what a beautiful world we are going into and how much good is in that world despite the bad news we sometimes are subjected to. And in our efforts to make it even better, may the world bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.